Hey guys, I hope you're all doing well today. We finally have a teaser for Rings of Power longer than a minute, and we finally gotten a peek at some of the things I've been waiting for since day one. We've got non-Hobbit characters speaking, our first look at some big Numenorean characters, our first look at Kaza Doom, and what may be a couple of huge First Age moments. As we dive in, please hit that subscribe button and the bell so you don't miss your dose of Middle Earth each and every week here on Nerd of the Rings. We open this teaser with the closing shot of the previous teaser. Again, we see three faces carved into the mountainside. I'm pretty sure this is Numenor, and this ship seems to be similar in style to the one we'll see later in the teaser. Also, since I didn't mention it in my last breakdown, my best guess is that this could possibly be the Vala Ulmo, the Lord of Waters, or perhaps Ose, one of the Maiar who serve Ulmo. Next, we have a close-up shot of the character providing voiceover during the opening, Galadriel. She says, There was a time when the world was so young, there had not yet been a sunrise, but even then there was light. And this is where we get an in-motion look at the first ever promotional image for the show. We've got the elven city of Tyrion and the two trees in the distance, which give light to all of Valinor. In the close-up shot, we can make out the silver Telperion and the golden Lorelin. Fun Tolkien fact, Telperion is male and Lorelin is female. Going back to Gladriel's close-up, I felt like the music we get here sounds incredibly familiar and immediately gave me a Middle-earth feel. And it turns out there's a good reason. Take a listen to the undertones in the Rivendell theme, and you'll find they're incredibly similar, if not in fact the same. Moving on, we now know that the figure walking up the hillside here is none other than Galadriel's brother, Finrod. More on him in a bit. Next, we come through the fog over a group of people crossing a stream. I honestly first mistook them for horsemen because they seem to be moving really fast. It's hard to say who these could be, but they seem to be in formation, which leads me to believe some kind of band of soldiers. I might guess orcs, but they're running in daylight, which makes me lean toward middlemen, which is a term for pretty much any man in Middle-earth not of Numenorean descent. One last note here, this location makes me think a bit of the Fords of Aizen from the Two Towers Extended Edition but this could honestly be just about anywhere that's near mountains. Here we have a similar shot, this time of what I'm pretty certain is the group of elves Galadriel is traveling with in the frigid northlands of Middle-earth. There's a bird flying overhead, which we follow for another one of those shots that makes you want to travel to New Zealand. For reference, it's believed this group is traveling somewhere in the northern waste, in the lands of Forodwaith which is a cold and mysterious portion of Middle-earth we know very little about. Next, we have what is almost certainly an elven realm. The architecture is very similar to what we saw in Tyrion, and I noticed that these waterfalls in the first shot may perhaps be the same ones we see in the background here. That being said, I could also see this being Linden, as that's a realm we'll no doubt spend significant time in during the course of the series. The High King Gil-galad rules from Linden throughout the Second Age, and we'll see a new shot of him shortly. One additional thing I couldn't help but notice is that this uppermost building looks a bit like a church, and makes me wonder if it could possibly be a location with religious meaning for the elves. Over this shot, we hear a Harfoot voiceover saying, Elves have forests to protect. And here we have our first glimpse of Casa Doom. As a huge dwarf fan, I've been itching to see this for some time, and it looks pretty similar to what we might expect. The designs carved into the rock seem to match pretty well with what we've seen in the Peter Jackson films, and definitely look as though they've had a John Howe influence. On the left, we have a couple dwarves who look like they're pulling levers to operate a pulley system. We've got some vegetation on the right side of the screen, which makes me wonder if this is someplace near ground level or if the dwarves have created a system with which to grow things within the mountain. Of course, we see there's a fair amount of firelight, but what immediately drew my attention and got me excited was the beams of light. This may seem insignificant to many, but in The Lord of the Rings, when the Fellowship travels through Khazad Doom, we learn that the dwarves did indeed have windows in the mountain, at least on the eastern side. The Fellowship makes camp in the 21st Hall of Khazad Doom, and when Frodo wakes, there are beams of light shining in near the ceiling. It's a fairly small detail here, but since it's from the books, I'm all about it. 
Over this shot, the voiceover continues saying the dwarves have their minds, meaning they have them to protect. Next, the voice says, men, their fields of grain. While we see a shot of, well, men harvesting fields of grain. As far as these men go, I'm pretty certain these are the aforementioned middlemen who already live in Middle Earth. There's a small village of wood houses and buildings in the background, and it definitely doesn't seem to match with the Numenor shots we've seen thus far. Not to mention that it wouldn't make much sense if a hobbit was referencing Numenorians, as there's no real reason for them to know each other exists. The next line is, but we Harfoots have each other, as we see the antler people in the distance, followed by a Harfoot turning their head and blowing a whistle. I guess this might explain why the Harfoots wear some of the headwear we've seen them in, but I don't know, I still think they look kind of ridiculous, but that's just my opinion. Next up, a slow motion shot of hobbits dancing through a forest. So presumably this is some kind of celebration. Or maybe it's a coming of age where a young Harfoot gets to wear random stuff in their hair. Now we've got the Harfoot giving the voiceover, concluding with, we're safe. And as if in answer, we get a big old meteor falling from the sky. This is of course the shot of Nori we saw in the previous teaser as she sees the meteor crash. Next up, we get the waterfall shot from the Super Bowl teaser. And we get Galadriel turning to look at another elf and she stabs her sword into the ground and they face each other in the same general location we've seen a few times now. You'll notice in this shot, the elf guy has a sword that matches Galadriel's. So these are presumably elven blades they're wielding. Looking into the background, I really can't tell if this area is just part of the mountains or if there could be some kind of structure back here. It's really hard to tell since that area isn't sharply in focus. Next up, we get a close up of the person who says the previous shot leading to this one. You have fought long enough, Galadriel. Put up your sword. Incidentally, I love the way Robert Arameo pronounces Galadriel. It's great. Galadriel turns to look at Elrond like she just might go a little crazy on him for suggesting such a thing. And we get a shot of the elves in the frozen north making their way through a blizzard. And finally, I can say that I've actually seen this shot before. And in that moment, it immediately brought to mind Ted Naismith's artwork of Fingolfin leading the elves across the Helcaraxe. Obviously, that isn't what this moment is depicting, but having such imagery called to mind was definitely a positive for me. Galadriel now has a line of dialogue saying, the enemy is still out there. The question now is where? This leads to a shot of the same group of elves and we see the hand of the snow troll moving in the foreground. The thing I notice here is that while there's definitely some snow and ice, it also looks like these points could be metal, making me wonder if they're approaching or even inside some kind of created structure. If the voiceover during this time is to be believed, I wonder if they are indeed looking for Sauron here. No question that is who Galadriel is referring to and concerned with. Sauron's master has been banished into the void by the Valar by this point, and Sauron himself has presumably already fled to Middle-earth. Now for those wondering why Galadriel would take such an interest in hunting down Sauron, we return to the character of Finrod. In the story of Beren and Luthien, Galadriel's brother is killed in the dungeons of Sauron. With her other two brothers killed in the earlier Dagor Bragolach, the Battle of Sudden Flame, this leaves Galadriel as the only surviving member of her family in Middle-earth. Next, we have another shot of another city along the water. I saw a lot of guesses that this could be either another shot of Linden or possibly Celebrimbor's realm of Austin Ethel. However, I'm leaning more toward this being a settlement of men. It definitely looks more Numenorean than Elven, and I couldn't help but notice the circular walls within the city. These make me immediately think of the later locations built by the Gondorians of Minas Tirith and Isengard which both had similar walls. Another interesting possibility would be if this could even be the Haven of Umbar, which at one point in the Second Age is made into a fortress by a Numenorean king. But with the time compression, it's hard to say how that might affect Umbar. Now seeming to get into more of an argument, Elrond says it is over, to which Galadriel responds, you have not seen what I have seen. Elrond replies, I've seen my share. Now whether they're talking about book events or not remains to be seen, but both of these characters have seen quite a lot, so each has a definite claim here. 
Galadriel, of course, is much older and has seen things like the first kinslaying of elves against elves, while Elrond was separated from his parents because of the third kinslaying, and he and his brother were left to be raised by their captors. So yeah, they've both seen some stuff. Continuing on, we see Galadriel in a scene that is completely red which is followed up with the most compelling shot of the entire trailer. Countless bodies floating in a sea of red. I've seen some theorize that this is the downfall of Numenor, but I'm pretty confident that it's way too early in the show for that. Instead, I think this is the aftermath of the War of Wrath, the massive 40-year battle that ends the First Age. Most prominent in this shot is a body impaled on a spear, and near the center of the frame, we see what I think is a tower sinking into the sea. While the War of Wrath means the defeat of Morgoth, it also brings about the destruction of a massive area of land in Middle-earth. I think we're seeing the lands of Beleriand, the fallen soldiers of the battle, and possibly a city itself sink into the sea. Galadriel repeats her line of, you have not seen what I have seen. I'm actually also wondering if this could just be massive amounts of ash on Galadriel as a result of dragons wreaking havoc and just the general apocalyptic nature of this insane battle. Having already seen a shot of Valinor in the Two Trees, the idea of seeing anything of the War of Wrath is sure to grab the attention of Silmarillion fans. If this is the War of Wrath, then it's kind of ironic because in the books, it actually seems more likely that Elrond would be in Beleriand during the War of Wrath whereas Galadriel is said to have gone to Middle-earth with her husband Celeborn at least 50 years before the War of Wrath began. Next, we have a shot of a Numenorean ship entering the island realm, followed by an over-the-shoulder shot of the Eärendil statue. Again, I really like this statue, as it not only reminds me of the Argonath, but I think comparing the two can give us a sense of the change we'll see in the civilization of men. Here we have Eärendil with an open palm, possibly in a gesture of welcome, whereas the later Argonath have palms facing out in a gesture of defiance toward the enemies of Gondor. Gil-galad comes in next saying, Darkness will march over the face of the earth. It will be the end not just of our people, but all peoples. The next shot is of Elrond turning around, possibly reacting to this very line by Gil-galad. I've been excited to see that Gil-galad will definitely be one of the few people who aren't hoodwinked by Sauron in this show. I thought with some of the early promo material that they were going to make Galadriel the only one wise to Sauron at the cost of Gil-galad and Elrond. This line, along with some recent interviews with the actors, have made me feel a lot better about this character. I have a feeling that this darkness that Gil-galad is perceiving will be the reason he sends Elrond to Khazad-dûm. Next up, we have a shot of orcs marching up a mountainside and across a bridge of some kind. I can't be certain, but I have a feeling this is the same bridge we saw two people walking on that leads to Arondir's tower that we've seen in a few shots now. Again, this is just my guess, but I think these orcs are attacking the tower that Arondir is on, and that he will get into the situation we've seen him in previous shots where he seems to be shackled in chains, and a shot we're about to see in this teaser. Now this orc right here seems to match this one from the earlier look at Weta's designs. The helmets look exactly the same to me. As Gil-galad says, our people, we get another shot of Galadriel and the swan ship full of elves we saw in the last teaser. Again, I have a theory that this is an attempt to sail back to Valinor that perhaps goes awry, leading to the shipwreck we know Galadriel is involved in. Next, we get a shot of Tar Miriel from last week's teaser with an added bird's eye shot. Now it could be that she's looking at the meteor as we were led to believe in the last teaser, but seeing a wider shot of this scene, it looks to be broad daylight. I think she's more likely reacting to either the white petals or perhaps whatever people might be saying around her. If they go with the more Peter Jackson-esque route concerning the white tree, it could be that the white tree, sensing an approaching threat, begins shedding its petals, which would give Miriel this oh no moment. And what I mean by Peter Jackson-esque is that in the films, the White Tree kind of comes back to life as Aragorn gets nearer to Minas Tirith. Whereas in the books, that tree is just straight up dead. But then Aragorn finds a sapling on Mount Mindoloin behind the city, which grows into the new White Tree. So we'll see when it comes out, but this definitely has a foreboding feeling to it. Next, we return to Nori and her friend, 
Poppy Proudfellow. And I think what we're seeing here is the aftermath of the crashed meteor. And we finally get a good look at Mr. Meteor Man himself, looking a bit like Castaway, while we have a Hobbit lantern in the background. And here we have Elrond being led through Khazad Doom by a couple of dwarf guards, and we get another great look at the interior of Khazad Doom. Again, we have some greenery as well as waterfalls. It looks vast yet full of life, and I can't wait to see Moria, not to mention the concept art that inspired it. Next, we have King Durin III saying, I am sorry, but their time has come. It looks like he's speaking to another dwarf here, and it's hard to tell in what context this line is delivered. And whose time is it that's come? It sounds like a somewhat standard line to show an older authority figure, weighing the fate of some people versus the risk of his own kind of thing. Then there's a quick shot of Durin IV smashing a boulder we've seen in earlier teasers. I'm still not digging the idea of simultaneous Durins, but I've covered that in another video, so we'll just keep trucking. Another quick shot of the elf who was talking to Galadriel earlier, who almost gets taken out by falling ice. Next up, we get our first look at Halbrand, and this looks to be in Numenor. I'm guessing this is likely some sort of court or maybe throne room. Next is a shot of a Rondir, where we get a good look at his chest plate, which I'm as confident as ever depicts an Ent. We then see a wider shot of the horse charge with Galadriel, and based on recent promo images, a cavalry of Numenorians. I notice some of them have the ponytail things on their helmets, much like we see on the Rohirrim in the Peter Jackson films. Now yesterday there was also some promo images released where we saw some Numenorians in armor. While I think this image of Muriel looks really good, and the designs of both wardrobe and scenery really pop, the second shot isn't nearly as strong. I can't quite put my finger on it, but their armor looks soft. I actually like the idea of working in the fish scale design to tie in the importance of the sea to Numenor. I've seen it done in fan art many times, but I don't know, this design just doesn't hit me the same way some of the elf and dwarf ones have. Two quick shots of Harfoot's hugging, followed by one of presumably Halbrand in his own shipwreck, where he'll meet Galadriel. Then we move on to a shot of a Numenorean ship, breaking over a wave, and a sealed door among the group of Numenorians upon it. Over these past several shots, I believe it's a sealed door we hear saying, the past is with us all, followed by his father Elendil saying, the past is dead. We either move forward or we die with it. First we'll cover the shots, then the dialogue. We get a couple shots of what we now know to be Elendil himself riding horses on the beach with Galadriel, confirming that she does indeed come to Numenor at some point. We see Elendil himself deliver the final line, and it's interesting to me that Elendil would be the one saying the past is dead. It seems like a very pessimistic view for someone who should be a leader among the faithful Numenorians. Not to say he can't still be a leader of the faithful, but I'm very curious what this means for Elendil's early arc in the show. I've personally been really focused on Gil-galad and Elrond as heroes I want to see done well, but Elendil is also right up there. He's got to be a character that we really care for if his final battle is going to land well. Much like Galadriel's character, I'm willing to give them a chance as they start out differently than we know them if the arc is satisfying and they arrive where they need to when they need to. I'm not 100% sure who he's talking to here, perhaps a Isildur, but who knows, maybe we'll actually get Isildur's brother Anarion in this show. I would love it if he's in it. Now that we've seen a man of the faithful, we have his counterpart, the leader of the King's Men, the reveal of Ar Farazan. It seems he's riled up a hundred or so Numenorians, no doubt laying the foundation for his attempt to usurp the throne from his cousin Tarmiriel. And this is one of the shots in the teaser that made this feel like a TV show and not a film for me. The lighting just seems really flat and the costumes of the crowd just seem kind of so-so. This along with the quick shot of a sealed door and the Numenorean armor just aren't much to write home about in regards to wardrobe. This scene just brings to mind similar scenes in the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit trilogies where each looked better visually in my opinion. But I won't get too judgy when it comes to a half second shot versus a full scene. We'll see how this plays out in September, but the big moments have got to feel big if this show is going to succeed. As far as far as on himself, I like this shot better because we've already seen his wardrobe has a lot more detail. And I think the design of this hall he's standing in front of looks pretty cool. 
It's also interesting how much gray is in Farzan's hair and beard. As I've said many times, the whole time compression thing is my biggest concern regarding the show. And it's kind of surprising that Farzan already seems pretty gray, when that would be one way to show his aging and drive home the fear of mortality that motivates him into later foolishness. Maybe they'll decide to do more with makeup or make him even grayer to drive home that point when the time comes. After a quick shot of a Numenorian grabbing a spear on horseback, we have Durin the Fourth who says, this could be the beginning of a new era. And I'm almost certain that we're seeing raw Mithril that he's holding in his hand here. Mithril, also called Moria Silver, is obviously hugely important to the dwarves of Khazad-dûm. And it's Mithril that Celebrimbor uses to invent Ithildin, the material which reflects starlight and moonlight and is used on the doors of Durin, which Celebrimbor helps the dwarf smith Narvi to create. I'm very curious to see, with the time compression, where in the history of Celebrimbor and Moria this story takes place. Are the doors of Durin already made? Has Celebrimbor already worked with Mithril? Or is that part of the reason he has an ulterior motive with sending Elrond into Moria? Either way, Durin IV definitely is driving home the importance of Mithril in this scene. Next is a shot of elves in a circle, drawing their swords. The swords seem to be similar in design to the ones we saw earlier, but the question is, what are we seeing here? My first and most exciting thought is that this could be the sons of Feanor making their dreadful oath to pursue the Silmarils at all costs. I can't help but notice that this is nighttime and there's no moon at least in the quick shot we see. The oath does take place after the two trees are killed by Morgoth and Ungoliant, meaning it would have been dark. Could this be part of a prologue sequence, where we are seeing something as momentous as the Oath of Feanor? It honestly gave me chills just thinking about it. Next up we have a shot of a Rondir dodging some kind of warg or wolf. He's definitely got that chain on his leg we saw in the first teaser, and I'm guessing this is part of the same scene where he'll probably try to make a daring escape. Next we have a quick shot of Galadriel evading the snow troll, then striking down on its head, and then we're on to a couple shots of Meteor Man. And like I noted on the first teaser, the rocks are actually moving upward in these shots, which leads me to believe there's some kind of magic afoot. And while you've probably already seen this shot by now, we get a bird's eye view of Meteor Man, and it's hard to ignore how much the silhouette looks like the shape of a certain eye. Is this our first hint that Meteor Man is indeed Sauron? It's certainly the possibility that makes the most sense to me. As I've said before, I think Sauron pretending to be an emissary sent from the skies could fit fine with his actions in the Second Age, and the fact that he can create illusions, in this case crash landing in a meteor. However, I couldn't help but also notice that the fire and flames seem to move inward, toward the guy in the center. This might be kind of out there, but assuming that this can't be a mortal man, and is far more likely to be a Maya like Sauron or the Wizards, I can't help but wonder if it's another similar being with a known association with fire. Obviously there's no firm reason to believe a Balrog would be in the Second Age, aside from Durin's Bane who should be hibernating in the depths of the Misty Mountains by now. But with the time compression that's going on, it's really hard to say. Could this be some creative license being taken with the way Balrogs flee from Beleriand after the First Age? I really don't know. I still have no idea who this guy is and still think Sauron makes the most sense canonically speaking. And finally we have a shot of four hobbits walking off on an adventure, which has surely never been done before. Okay, that was a little snarky, but by now you probably know that hobbits are pretty far down on my list of things I'm interested in for this show. Right now I'm just kind of tolerating them in hopes that they won't be too big of a focus and we'll get some great stuff of Numenor, Casa Doom, the elves, and of course Sauron himself that dominate the screen time. Overall, I think there's some things to be really pumped about in this teaser, as well as some things that I'm not overly impressed with. While some of the sets and costumes have looked really good, there's also some that look less cinematic and more made for TV than what I had hoped for. And as far as dialogue, I'm definitely going to be looking for the characters to sound Tolkienian in the show, and I don't know if a teaser is the best place to gauge that. Most of the lines are pretty boilerplate statements about stakes and grim tidings and the like, and likely more geared to piquing the interest of casual fans or new ones. 
So we'll see what the show sounds like when we get full scenes to take in. Well, that's it guys, another teaser in the books. What'd you think of our first looks at the Numenorians and Khazad Doom? Do you agree that this epic shot is the War of Wrath? And what do you think of my Sauron or Balrog theory for Meteor Man? Let me know what you think in the comments. And as a special announcement, I've decided to go to San Diego and cover Comic-Con next week. I'll catch as much as I can related to Middle Earth, including Rings of Power, catching up with Tolkien artists, and as many other fun franchises as I can find. I'll also be streaming live during the OneRing.net's after party next Friday, where I'll break down everything we learned from the panel that day. So make sure you're subscribed and have those notifications turned on so you don't miss it. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Listen Me the Cinda, Mandu Pandu, Andrew Carlisle, The Mighty Mim, Team Weasel, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Salim Rahman, Zetrock, Berto Berg, Grand Strategy Nerd, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Michael Wu, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description and purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.